Sorry. And we should be all right. Okay, let's have a chat. Um, so, well, here's the title: Privacy and Data Sovereignty. We'll see how much uh, how much we get through. So we only have 45 or so minutes. Um, so, the conversation today will be will be related to blockchain technology, but of course it's not exclusive to blockchain technology. And if you take out the blockchain stuff, it could very easily stand on its own. Okay, so let's look at the context of where we are right now. So New Zealand has this Privacy Act. It's from 1993, which might be before you were born. Uh, I was about 10 years old at the time, so it's quite a while ago now. Privacy, which supports or creates feelings of security, is an important human right. So I think we can agree with this. Definitely that it creates feelings of security if you have privacy. Uh, and it's been deemed as a human right. So as important as fundamental human needs, um, you know, access to food, water, and shelter, uh, access to government and due process, and in here we have we have privacy. Of course, that's not all there is to it. Uh, it's important, but it is not absolute. Other social interests can be more important than privacy in some instances. All privacy laws make allowances for other interests such as, so here are some of the caveats where your privacy is no longer considered to be a human right. So preventing crime, ensuring safety, and ensuring that courts get information to make their decisions. So this is not my language, this is words right out of the Privacy Act. Now the Privacy Act is getting an update, or I, I suppose it already has an update because it's supposed to be public very soon in a couple months. There's supposed to be an updated version of this and this is you know, very topical stuff when we're talking about online activity and data um, how does that fit into the Privacy Act? So this is how New Zealand views it, and you can see here straight away, uh, these are some pretty broad categories, right? I mean, preventing crime, right? It doesn't even suggest that uh, there's evidence that a crime has taken place, but it's such that if it's considered um, that your activity could be involved in preventing crime, well then, suddenly your privacy is not as important as the goal of preventing crime, which on, which on one level is very reasonable and, and makes sense, of course, um, how far can, can it be taken? Okay, so coming back to um, money and blockchain and Bitcoin, where does this sit just in terms of, first we'll look at cash and then what banks are up to. Okay, so this is a this is a favorite keyword of people involved in cryptocurrencies is that it's fungible. So fungible means that any object is interchangeable with another one, such that um, cash is considered fungible because if I give you a twenty dollar note and then you give each other a twenty dollar note, you don't care which actual physical piece of paper got exchanged, right? They both have the same value. So even though they have serial numbers, they're considered interchangeable. Uh, so that's the idea of something that is, that is fungible, is that it's interchangeable. So the ultimate non-fungible good is artwork. So if you have a piece of artwork, it's an original created by an artist, all right? You can have copies and prints, but you only ever have one of that original artwork. So that would be a non-fungible good on the, on the other end. Um, additionally, fungible stuff at the atomic level is anything in the periodic table, right? You cannot tell the difference between a molecule uh, of water and another molecule of water. So at the atomic level, things are extremely interchangeable. Uh, so cash is peer-to-peer. -peer. You don't need to call up anyone for permission. You don't need to uh, have two-factor authentication to use cash. You just have it and you transact. So in that sense, it's permissionless as well, right? You don't need to, um, you don't need to sign into your bank account to use cash. So really, cash is still the most private way to transact, uh, even more private than cryptocurrencies. And we'll talk about some of those details momentarily. 
Oh yeah, so this is let's let's take a quick segue here. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, September 24th, so this is very topical. Uh, so banks won't accept cash from customer trying to deposit money into a friend's account. Okay, so Diane here uh, is used to going into her bank, ASB, and depositing money into her friend's account at another bank. So she takes her cash in and has her friend's details and says, hey, can you deposit this money? So ASB has now said, no, we can't do this anymore. Uh, and the reasons that they cite, uh, when it comes to third-party deposits, we encourage customers of other banks to transfer funds electronically via online banking. Okay, yes, they do. Uh, for regulatory purposes. So poor Diane here, is, is that her name? Yeah, poor Diane, right? She's not allowed to transfer cash because it doesn't meet regulatory purposes, right? So regulatory just means banking law. Uh, and then there's something else in here. Oh yeah, this is one way we can limit unnecessary face-to-face -face contact in our branches. So this is important because you read this and you think, oh yeah, face-to-face -face contact, we are you know, in some version of a lockdown and it's possible there could be virus transferred between uh, customers, you want to remain in business, so you want to limit face-to-face -face contact. But what's really happening here is the banks are using this as an excuse, okay, to remove those cash services. So they're saying, and I think you'll see this a lot in times of COVID-19, um, they're using the pandemic as an excuse to push forward policies, okay, that essentially are stripping people of privacy, um, or in Diane's case, they're actually removing a service that she uses. Uh, so they're taking that away and they're saying, well, actually it's, it's unsafe and there's regulatory purposes. Uh, so, and, and like this is, you know, this was a couple days ago right here. So this is an example um, of what's happening with cash or perhaps we should say with cash going away. Okay, so cash doesn't necessarily uh, have to do cash isn't necessarily the same thing as banks, although banks at least used to, as we just saw, operate in cash as well. Um, so from a bank's point of view, they are corporate entities, okay? So this means that they have to uh, follow corporate law as opposed to um, being a human or an individual. So that's the first thing to note here. Um, they are good at keeping your data private, and that's because they have an incentive to do so. Uh, so although there are leaks and hacks of uh, customer data at banks, uh, it's generally, they're pretty good at storing your data. And if you try to go into a bank and get somebody else's data, they won't let you because they have very good procedures in place. And indeed, this is their, this is their business. Uh, on the other hand, this represents a single point of failure, both from a technological point. So if a bank has a Maybe a smaller bank or a credit union might only have one, um, you know, one server rack in one uh, service provider uh, that represents a single point of failure. Um, so there could be that uh, as well. Um, and because they are corporate entities and they have to ha sort of play by these regulatory rules, the government has the right to seize assets and freeze accounts. For most of us, this is no problem at all um, because we are sort of small fish in a big pond. You get paid a couple thousand dollars and you spend a couple thousand dollars in every cycle, you know, and you go about your life. Um, but there are times when the government can seize assets and freeze accounts and the bank just puts their hands up and says, actually, we're, we can't do anything because um, we're, we have to um, adhere to these regulations. So this is kind of a new hot keyword of the day, CBDCs. This is central banking digital currencies. So pretty much every central bank right now is talking about having a digital currency. Uh, and this is where, this is where cash, so they're removing cash services, okay? And they're consolidating them into 
digital currency. So most transactions are digital anyways, we know this, but there is still cash and it's anonymous or it's extremely private. Um, and actually it's in the interest of the state and the central banks to get rid of cash. Uh, and in the guise of blockchain, this is called a, a central bank digital currency. Uh, so I think there are a few places, I think China is the uh, leader right now in terms of having a viable product ready to push to its citizens. Um, and so the digital yuan is a central bank digital currency. Um, and basically what this means is at the end of the day, every single dollar that is transacted by a citizen can be tracked. And so although in the Chinese case, uh, individuals can't look at the ledger and see what's happening, so it's not completely open, but the banks can look at the ledger and see what's happening, right? So when you go out and spend 20 bucks that you maybe don't want to show up in your account, well, there it is. And if there's no more cash, then everything is going to be tracked that way. So what about Bitcoin and Ethereum? How do they fit into this? Uh, well, they are pseudonymous, so they're not completely anonymous, and that's because it's an open ledger, and so all the transactions are available in the blockchain. Which really means that there's no confidentiality. So it's kind of the opposite in a sense, in that every single transaction is in the open on both of these networks. Um, and there are sort of very good third-party block explorers that can crawl the chain and search the chain and show you what you want to find. Uh, block Explorer, we looked at Etherscan last week. So there's just tons of data on Etherscan and uh, you can continue to dig into transactions uh, and addresses and contracts and see exactly what's going on. So what does this mean in terms of privacy? Well, it means that addresses or accounts in Ethereum can be marked or tainted um, in a, in a non-fungible way. So suddenly your account that you thought was anonymous, just a string of characters, if it's marked or shows up in some database, you might not even know about it and it shows up in some database, maybe um, part of the transaction, part of the coins came from a hack and maybe it happened years ago and you had no idea about it and the hackers then sort of moved the coins around and sold them and you came in to some of these years and years later and you didn't know about it, um, your address could now be tainted or marked. Uh, and so this is, a, this is a problem, this is a censorship problem from the CBDC perspective of those digital currencies, but also exists uh, in open systems like Bitcoin and Ethereum. And so suddenly this becomes non-fungible where your coins, because they can be tracked back to an origin, no longer are interchangeable just like cash. Now there's a flip side to this, which I think is going to happen with Bitcoin in the future, is that you're gonna find coins that are really old or coins that are from a Coinbase transaction, which is the fresh newly minted coins. Uh, if you get your hands on those coins, they're going to be even more valuable than having a regular old wash transaction that's been through the mill. So if you can get your hands on brand new coins that have just been minted, either from a miner or uh, from your friend on the web, um, then those coins don't have a history. So that is going to become more and more important, or it could be become more and more important. Um, and we'll look at a case of some old coins of Satoshi's in a second. Okay, so why is this the case? Well, as we've seen to make a transaction um, unspent coins have to point to an address. It's all hashed and it's all recorded. And if you, try to, if you try to get around this in any sense, then that transaction won't be validated and you won't be able to, to publish it. So it's all right there recorded. So if you do have the transaction activity, then what you can do is you can start to de-anonymize uh, the account. So even though it starts with just an account or a string, um, if you have all the activity, you can start to put together a bigger picture, right? Just sort of like a detective would by looking at someone's credit card statement, you could kind of figure out where they're going to be, what their activity is. So the same sort of thing. Um, and then that could lead you back to an individual, which then uh, outs their identity. So in the same mix here, uh, there's non-repudiation associated with uh, 
digital transactions like this, and that's because you have to sign the transaction with your digital signature. Um, so if someone comes back and says, uh, hey, did you purchase this bundle of goods down at the docks on Saturday night? You, you say, oh, no, it wasn't me. Um, then they could look and say, well, actually, your private key signed the transaction, and suddenly that means that it could not have been anyone else. So that's what non-repudiation means. And from a legal standpoint, that's important because then that um, basically is as good as targeting you as the reason behind it. Um, of course, in law, we need some we need some play for possibility of people being coerced and uh, this sort of thing. And so this is why it's not necessarily a perfect system. But from a technical point of view, we have non-repudiation in there as well. So an old quote from Satoshi, the risk is that if the owner of a key is revealed, then you could link all the other transactions that that key has used, all right? and suddenly you paint a big picture of all the transactions belonging to the same owner. So even if your transactions are private today, what happens in the future when there is a leak or your identity gets revealed, then people can go back in time and look at your, your activity or your behavior. So it's kind of like a minority report in reverse, and if you are up to nefarious activities, or maybe the laws change in the future and suddenly your activities from three years ago are illegal, um, you know, then who, who knows, right? That's an interesting thought experiment. Uh, so here's an example of this, uh, what people can do to this transaction data. So this was earlier this year and some old coins got moved, has moved 50 Bitcoin that were mined in February 2009. Okay, so some extremely old coins have been moved. So some speculated immediately that these were Satoshi's coins. Um, and then immediately the, uh, the Bitcoiners got on it and dug into the data because of course you can look at the whole blockchain and they found this pattern. So this is block number here. So this is very low. We're up to over half a million blocks now, 600,000 even. And so this is very in the early days, and on the y-axis is the nonce, right? So when you hash, when you hash your transaction, you increment the nonce, rehash, and you're looking to meet that target. And when you meet the target, then you go and work on the next block. And so, uh, because so few people were mining, the nonces were incrementing, and Satoshi did not have to reset the nonce all the way all the way back. Eventually the nonce did reset and you can see these blue ones thought to be Satoshi's coins. Uh, the ones that just moved though fit into this block here, okay, and you can go look at the nonce as well in the blockchain and you see that this dot doesn't fit on these lines and so probably it was another early miner, right? This line here is probably another independent miner. Of course we don't know who, we just know that if somebody's transaction was able to be mapped to an individual, you could go back and say, this is probably all your activity as well. So that was kind of interesting, came out earlier this year, um, but turned out not to likely be Satoshi's coins. And in fact, it's likely, I think, that Satoshi will never move his or her or their coins. That's my thought. So what can we do about this? So privacy coins you know, have been on this problem of pseudo-anonymity from the beginning and have been looking at doing something about it. So here we, we see some of them. I think Monero is the biggest one uh, to date. Uh, this triangle, this is Verge, which has been in the news recently because Pornhub, the online pornography site, now accepts Verge. And you know that makes perfect sense. You don't necessarily want to use your credit card to pay for these services, um, especially since your credit card might not allow you to pay for these services. So use a private digital currency. This one is Zcash. Uh, Horizon and Dash, and uh, this isn't a uh, project logo, but it's a project called Taproot, which is looking to bring privacy features to Bitcoin. So how do these currencies do this? Uh, so Monero has all transactions are private and untraceable. Some of these other ones have optional private transactions, okay? So you can choose to use a normal one, which will be faster, 
uh, and show up on the blockchain, or you can choose to use a private one, a private address. Uh, so they, they have various bits of technology, stealth addresses to hide who you're sending it to, ring signatures to hide who is sending it, right, the sender. Um, if you need to audit, uh, the sender and what they're up to. Um, there's an option there that you can view what's happening. Um, something called ring CT, ring confidential transactions to hide the amount. So that's another level of anonymity, right? Uh, if somebody is transacting in much larger volumes, then that tells you some behavior characteristic about them compared to if somebody is transacting in much smaller volumes. Uh, let's hide the location while we're at it, right? So I2P routing to hide the uh, IP addresses of where they are and bounce it around, all right? Now, this is not a cryptography course, uh, so we, we won't go into these details, but they're all separate bits of technology. And you know from software design that the more pieces of tech you have in one project, basically the more complex it gets. Uh, and it's, it's not easy stuff. Okay, so Zcash, this is sort of the other major player in privacy technology, and the Z stands for zero. Um, and when you see the term ZK or ZK, that stands for zero knowledge, meaning that you don't have any knowledge. Okay, so ZK, wherever it shows up a lot in crypto projects, it means that you have no knowledge of something. Uh, so they use shielded transactions, um, and you have the option here, so you don't have to use a shielded transaction. Uh, importantly, it's open source, so you can audit the code. Now, you may not know what's going on, but hopefully somebody does know what's going on, and they can also audit the code. So benefit to open source projects, even if you yourself don't uh, want to wade through the cryptography, hopefully somebody else will. Uh, my stat's a little bit old here, but as of almost two years ago, only 4% of coins were in the shielded pool. So this is a problem as well because if only one person is running around using private transactions, then you can use the process of elimination to see what that one person is doing. Um, now a lot of this cryptography has a high computational burden. So there's quite a lot of math involved in order to create uh, these proofs such that you can say, yes, um, I do have the coins, but no, I'm not gonna uh, be able to publish the amount to the blockchain, so something like that. And maybe I'll skip that link in the interest of time. This is kind of a newer project, um, Grin, which runs on the Mimble Wimble protocol. Um, and so Grin is one where you don't have the option of having a regular transaction, but all transactions um, basically are completely anonymous. So they don't store amounts or addresses. Um, and the further in time back you go, you can actually erase your history. And to add to the allure, uh, some of the developers are anonymous. So they created it, published it online um, using a pseudonym uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so Mimblewimble is out there. It doesn't have as much traction as these others that I've been talking about, um, but it is there. And again, the tech is open source for you to see. So I wanna go through an example of, or an, an analogy of a zero knowledge proof. So the idea here is that you wanna prove you know something without revealing it. So take a statement, I control this address, right? You can publish your public key. Um, and how do you prove it? Well, you can sign a message with your private key um, as, as one way to do it. Um, what's another statement? I have the required funds. So if you want to enter into a business deal and you know, say you need $1,000, I don't want to waste my time if you don't have the available funds ready for the deal. So you might want to be able to prove that yes, in your account, you have $1,000, right? Um, so this is something that banks do if they're gonna give you a mortgage, right? You have to go through some process of having a deposit and before you actually get the deed, 
then your funds all go into escrow to make sure um, that everyone is in agreement with the terms and all the funds are there and so on and so forth. So you might want to prove that you have the required funds without actually you know, opening up your banking app and saying, look, I've got a million dollars, right? Because that's uh, giving up some of your privacy. Um, so an idea, you, you don't want outside observers to be able to know what's going on, so just the parties that are involved. Um, and you often need a trusted setup, which involves a lot of cryptography and computational power. So here's, uh, here's one analogy called Alibaba's Cave. So we've got P for prover, okay, and V for verifier. So P, the prover, is going to prove that they know the password to this door. So this is a plan view. They're going to walk through the cave. They're going to prove they know the password to the door without revealing what the password is. Okay, so how do you... Uh, how do you prove you have access to something without actually revealing the password so that the other person can verify? Well, here's one, one way to show how you could do that. So there's two paths, right? You could go A or B, and the verifier knows this. So what the prover is going to do is the prover is going to walk randomly, take a path A or B, and walk to the door. And then the verifier is going to yell out, okay, I want you to show up at path B. So if the prover is here on side A, then they have to go through the door in order to come back around and show up via path B. And then they open the door and they come back around and the verifier says, okay, I believe that you know the password. Okay, so now that scenario works out fine. What if the prover goes to this side Okay, so what if P is here? And then the verifier says path B. Well, then the prover is already on the same side, comes out and says there, I know the password, but did not have to pass through the door. So that's fine because the verifier outside here, the verifier knows that it's a random chance that you're gonna be on the right side of the door. So they say, let's do it again. And now suddenly you have to get lucky twice in a row if you don't know the passphrase Let's do it again, three times in a row, right? And so you can see here that statistically, it doesn't take many um, iterations before you are assured that the person knows the password. So that's one analogy, okay? I've got another one for us. Uh, so where's Wally or where's Waldo, depending on, uh, on uh, which uh, European culture you came from. I don't know if you guys had Wally or Waldo. Um, so the idea here is it's a children's book. And you're shown a page like this, and there's lots of interesting things going on, and you have to look and find Wally. So it says, uh, "Hey, Waldo, watchers! Uh, you know this is uh, Waldo's travels around the world. It's a postcard." Uh, and so here's the scene, and it may take you a little bit of time to find Wally. So I'm going to prove to you that I know where Wally is. And of course, you have the whole scene. So you can look, and you can see lots of people in striped jumpers. We're looking for a red and white stripe. I saw another one in here. There's someone in a red and white striped jumper, right? Um, so that's what Waldo looks like. He, he's always wearing the same thing. OK, so here's my proof. I'm going to say, well, bam, there he is. And you get an idea of what he looks like in this scene. Now this is just the original one again. So now I give it back to you and I say, all right, have you got it? And of course you're a little bit far away. If you had it, you'd be getting right at it. If you had it print out, you'd be getting right in there close. Do you have it? Do you have it? So the trick here, I'll go back. So here's the original scene. You can imagine this being a very, very big scene, right? So here it would take a human, you know, between a couple seconds and a couple minutes to scan the whole scene, right? Imagine something really, really big that even a computer can't scan that fast. 
you can point to where it is and you can say, look, there it is and you can, I can show you. So that's my proof. Now, in terms of the analogy, as long as I have at least twice the distance between any border, then you can't place it in terms of, you know, if I had to put, if I had to put him way up there where he actually was, that would kind of lead you to look there again. So I'm allowed to move it around like that. I'll only reveal what I need to reveal, okay, um, in order to show you that I know. So that's an example of being able to prove something without actually revealing the entire uh, piece of information. So another use case here is being able to prove your age when you buy liquor. So to go buy beer, you have to be 18, but maybe you don't want to give up. If you show your ID card, your driver's license, right, it has other personal information. So if you want to prove you're old enough to buy beer, you don't need to prove your address. You don't need to prove your birth date. You just need to prove that you're greater than or equal to 18 years of age. So that's an, an example of where this could be used. Um, and that's what a proof of ID card does, I believe. It, or that's what it could do is just show that, yes, the bearer, you know, your name and your photo and say, yes, this person's 18, but then doesn't have to show my birthday. So I could use it, you know, when I'm 45 and say, oh, look how young I am. But really, you don't know because there's no birthday on it. Okay, so a more simple way here, and th this is a, a different strategy altogether, is just mixers. So if you imagine paying with cash, um, at the time of transaction, if it's peer-to-peer -peer with someone, you do have some, uh, some privacy slippage there because they know the amount and they know you, they see you. But if everybody puts their cash transactions into a big pile, all right, and then someone comes along and sorts them afterwards and then gives them out, uh, then that adds to the anonymity. And so these are called mixers. So this is a diagram here from CoinJoin. So we can see here that Bob $20 goes into the transaction, so Bob paid 15, he gets five in return, and Ted gets 15. So Bob paid Ted 15, or in this one, Alice paid Carol eight. So two transactions, and if you look at them individually, you know the amounts. You know the ins and the outs. Okay, you don't, you don't know it's Carol, but you know the amounts. So a way um, to remove this, which is pretty simple to implement, is you put them all in a single transaction here. So this is in the coin join transaction. So now we have our, our inputs 20 and 10 all in a pool. And then the outputs get sent to the right people, but you don't necessarily know who got what. And if it's a large enough pool, then it's really hard to figure out um, who got what. So that's what a mixer is doing. Of course, you have to pay for that third party um, for that third-party service, right? Um, so there's a, there's a payment in fees, an extra fee, and there's also trust. You have to trust whoever put that service together that they are not going to take off with the pool. Okay, so I wanna tie this in a little bit to talk about data. And this is because in cryptocurrency and blockchain transactions, we talk about amounts and we talk about addresses uh, and pooling them together. Um, but really, transactions are just data that's been hashed. So it doesn't have to be monetary amounts. So all transactions are just data, as you've seen in your projects. You aren't necessarily transacting in funds or tokens. Okay, you could be transacting, um, well, really in anything that you can, that you can represent digitally. So data falls into this or sort of naturally is an extension of this. So here's a, here's a question. Who owns your data? Who wants to go first? It can be any data you want to think of. Who owns it? Me, me, myself, or the data. Yeah, your, so your data. Yeah, who owns your data? Okay, what? Give us the context. Uh, let's say, for example, Google Drive. 
Google Drive, big one? What they say is So you're not technically owning your, yourself because you know, your your intellectual property, right? Your work that you're creating and working on is there on their on their servers, which is their property, right? We're not paying to own a share of their servers. Um, and what about? So I don't know this. Do you know is the data on Google Drive encrypted? Like, is it visible to Google engineers? Yeah, do you know? I don't know. I don't. I don't know either. Um, so, so that's a good one. What about? Uh, so let's take uh, what's the new social media app? TikTok. You have a TikTok account. Was it a Chinese government or you? <laughs> Chinese government or? And so, have you heard what's going on in America with TikTok? Yeah. Right. Like so, that's a big issue, right? Um, so, um, as far as I know, Americans don't want the Chinese government owning this data. They want the data to be inaccessible. Um, and of course, all corporations in China have to play by the Chinese government rules. Um, so they want the data to be inaccessible to, to them and so that it's only um, useful to the user. Uh, so, that's, so that's a good one. Uh, Facebook. Who owns that data? So say you're working on a real cool uh, DIY project and you post some photos of it to Facebook. Or maybe it's a maybe it's a serious DIY project. You're building some sort of like nuclear uh, fission device. Some some kid in New Zealand, some high school kid in New Zealand, early, early this year or late last year. Um, built like a some sort of fission radiation device, okay, uh, and then tried to sell it on trade to like raise money so that he could go to university, right? Like something, something really awesome and innocent. Um, and uh, trade me eventually made him take down the posting because he built something that like violated New Zealand's like Atomic Energy Commission, something like this. I'm paraphrasing, but. Uh, so something like, like that happens. So what if you post photos of something you make to Facebook? The US copyright. Yep. Or is it or is it Facebook themselves as the American corporation? I mean, uh, so these are these are hard questions and the lines are very blurry, right? Um, I just got an email last night from a New Zealand cryptocurrency service. So there's a couple of providers in New Zealand where you can go buy coins. And uh, the email said that the IRD, the Internal Revenue Department, they do the taxes, has demanded all of the data from these cryptocurrency services. Uh, so the email was just informing me that because I had transacted through their service, my details had been turned over to the IRD, right? and I didn't, I didn't authorize this. And when I first transacted, because it was in the past, I didn't know that this was going to be the case. Um, but the IRD stepped in and said, they said, we need all your customer data, so that includes names, um, addresses, so these are currency addresses, not um, residential addresses, names, addresses, and amounts, and what coins they purchased. So anyone that's used these providers in New Zealand now is in a queue at IRT waiting to be audited. So even if you thought your data was secure with a provider, if that provider has to play by the rules in their country or their jurisdiction, um, then it may not be in the future. OK. so. We're making progress. This is starting to change. The GDPR from a few years back uh, came out in Europe and included uh, what's known as the right to be forgotten, which means that you can request for your data to be removed or deleted. Um, 
So business processes that handle personal data must be designed and built with consideration of the principles and provide safeguards to protect data. So that means that from the beginning when you're designing a service, when you're building TikTok to operate in the European Union, you need to have processes in place to control user data and you have to enable privacy settings by default uh, and you, you have to um, you have to actively take measures to prevent that data from being hacked or leaked. So you could be at risk if you don't have security measures in place and someone is able to breach your servers and steal customer data. Okay, so that could, that could be your fault and not theirs, not the hackers. So the GDPR, uh, there are plans in place for similar acts to um, be brought forth in other jurisdictions, but again, this so far only affects the European Union, the specific GDPR. Um, and they consider personal data to be all of these things. So names, date of birth, ID numbers, email addresses, online identifiers, photographs, religious beliefs, and location data, for example. So when I look at this list of personal data, I see, or I don't see anything that could not be on a blockchain. So when you consider this stuff, so don't just think that it's only ID numbers maybe or like transaction accounts, account values that have to do with data being stored on a blockchain. Uh, so it could be all of this stuff, right? Anything that can be represented digitally can be put on a blockchain. So just some examples here of early breaches of this. British Airways, 183 million pounds. So I think that's the biggest one because customer data was stolen. Poor web security leading to a basic attack. A uh, basic web skimming attack even. So something that your little brother probably could do. Um, Google is another big one. And this is just Google in Europe, fined 50 million euros. Insufficient transparency, control, and consent over the processing of personal data for the purposes of behavioral advertising. Okay, so really this is about transparency. So what is Google using your data for? Well, you don't really know, and they don't go out of their way to tell you what they're using your data for. And then there's this whole behavioral aspect of it. And because we're almost out of time, I'm gonna jump to I didn't need to jump, it was the very next slide. Uh, so the social dilemma, so I just saw it this weekend. This is the popular doco on Netflix right now. Um, and so these are just some of the quotes describing what's happening. Uh, so the main, the main, uh, I guess we'll call him a developer in the, in the film, uh, he says, there's a problem happening in the tech industry and it doesn't have a name. Uh, so people are aware that there's this problem and of course this is what the movie is highlighting. Uh, and he says, but it doesn't have a name so we can't really point to anything. Um, shortly thereafter, in response to the new media argument, so the new media argument says that, well, when the television came out, everyone was worried about people watching too much television and being controlled by the advertisers, you know, and being controlled by the networks and people are, are glued to the television and it's real evil. And then you go back further in time and say, well, when the radio came out and you could listen to people talk over the airwaves, uh, there was a similar argument. Well, you know, now society, you know, it's gone to the dogs. Everybody's crowded around a radio listening for the latest update sort of thing. So that's the new media argument. Uh, and so the same person says, uh, there's something distinctly new here. So they're talking about social media in general. And they're saying that, no, it's not the same anymore. Um, and one of the reasons could be that processing power has gone up a trillion times, right? So it's an unfathomably large number. We can't comprehend what a trillion times is. Of course, you can write down the number mathematically. But, you know, humans aren't really designed to process really large numbers. Um, and with that processing power, you know, we have AI being able to, um, find trends and actually be able to sort through all of the data uh, that is being collected. Uh, this is a author who says, 
we have almost no laws around digital privacy. So this author, she wrote a book called Surveillance Capitalism, which is uh, another key word of the last few years. And I mean, we've seen the law from 1993. Well, what type of social media was there in 1993, right? There was not none. And the people that wrote those laws um, probably had no idea even that like pets.com and Amazon uh, were going to, you know, uh, we're going to represent digital commerce and take it and and this uh, growth in the web. Um, the laws run way behind. The law runs way behind and is in place to protect the rights of these giant companies and not the individuals. So just like the bank is a corporation, not an individual, so the laws are there to protect Facebook, the laws are there to protect Google, and the laws are not there to protect the users or the individuals. Um, and this doesn't, you know, this doesn't mean that the people that work at these places are inherently evil and doing wrong. They're not. On a on a one to one basis, you know, everybody is trying to, um, you know, go to work every day, live a good life, and uh, contribute to the cause and the company that they're working for. All right, but the laws are meant to protect the corporation, which is a separate entity from the individuals or the users. Um, and another character in the film said, well, what's actually happening is it's a gradual, slight, and imperceptible change in your behavior. That's the product. So there's the adage that if you're not paying for the service, then you are the product, right? All these services are free, and you think, well, that's great. But then at the end of the day, five, ten years on, you look at the results, and you say, well, what's happened here? Um, and he says, well, actually, it's the change in your behavior and it happens so slight that you don't even don't even notice it. Um, so an example that I like to think of is when you visit older websites, you may be reminded that there was a day before infinite scroll. So when you can scroll to the bottom of a web page and you have to click next page to find the other results, it's like, oh hang on. Um, now we're used to having infinite scroll. And so that's kind of one of these tactics that keeps you glued because if you can't ever get to the bottom, you know, you don't have that mental barrier that now it's time to, to leave. Okay, I'm out of time. So I'm going to call it there.